All right, we're just going to wait for a minute or two for everyone to filter in, and then we are going to go ahead and get started, everybody. Alrighty. So we're about two past here. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you to everybody for coming by to the first of uh, what is our now second year of doing career uh, career development seminars. Uh, this is our the AIA and SCS. Uh, I would I, I almost called it an attempt. I guess last year was the attempt, and this year is the continuation of the uh, sort of showing the many career paths open to people in classics and archaeology by bringing in former classicist archaeologists, etc., current classicist archaeologists, etc., and just having them speak towards the things that they could have done better or could have learned or would like to pass on any kind of insight on the job market is immensely helpful, as everybody knows. So uh, we kept it going for a year, and it's still around. So that means, uh, and you all are here, so we're doing something that people are interested in. So today in particular, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, teaching at liberal arts colleges and comprehensive state universities, a little more academically themed than our kind of entire last year. Uh, so we're going to be generally this year, if I could just plug the entire year's worth of programming, going to be kind of going on and off this year between academic and I don't even want to say non-academic, but other uh, other job types. Um, and hopefully that'll maybe keep the pace a little more interesting and give some touchstones that we're maybe a little more familiar with. Um, Typically, what we like to do is start this off with a very quick breakout session of just you and one or two other people, just so you don't feel like, you know, it's just a bunch of strangers in a room. Uh, we will be doing the same here again. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on doing that. And then once we are done, we're going to come back here and uh, we'll do introductions. And this thing should run until about three o'clock. I, we like respecting people's time here. So we'll be very, very prompt. So I'm gonna go ahead and create these rooms and I will see you all in no more than five minutes.
think we have just about everybody back. So if that is the case, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pre-introduce uh, our speakers uh, today. I'm a much bigger fan of people telling me about themselves rather than what I can Google about them. So I am just going to say that our speakers today are Nadia and Elizabeth. They're going to be uh, giving a short presentation about uh, one each about what they are uh, going to be bringing to this discussion. And then we're going to be moving right into the much more robust uh, and uh, back and forth question and answer towards the end. Uh, so Nadia, I turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, as much as death by PowerPoint has become topic of jokes, it still can be helpful to see some sort of visual. So I get to talk to you about teaching at Original Comprehensive State University. Uh, so my undergrad was at a large state research-oriented institution, University of Virginia. And then I did my PhD at Princeton. So when I went on the job market, I did the thing that, what, well, everybody does. I applied for everything imaginable. Well, one thing I discovered at some point, I think one of my professors pointed me to it, that I could double dip. I applied for jobs through the SCS, but I also applied for history jobs through the AHA. And so my job is actually at in a history department. So let me back up for a second. Like, what is a regional comprehensive state university? Our mission is essentially to be all things to all people. It's a regional comprehensive. Uh, we're not like, we're not gatekeepers. If you want to come here, um, you basically can, um, and we will help you get a good education. A lot of our students are first generation college um, and so on. So like very different institutions than where you might be studying right now. Uh, average number of classes per campus, usually one, and that's you. So it's a very different environment coming from your PhD program where you're immersed, you're around all these other classes, all these people you can nerd out with who speak, or well, not necessarily speak, but who know Greek and Latin, who are used to talking with you about your research and so on. And suddenly, this is just you. Oh, and the term classics, like, like that you take for granted, the average number of students who would know what classics is before taking your class is probably zero. So a lot of times you will get students who take a class with you. So for instance, I teach introduction to classical studies um, and they have no idea what they signed up for. It does fulfill a requirement in the core, so they will learn, but there we have it. But it's exciting because you get that potential to essentially introduce students to your field who have never really heard about it. So the job interview. So again, I interviewed for both SCS and AHA jobs. And in interviewing for this particular job, the emphasis was very much teaching. And that was the case in other comprehensive state universities where I've interviewed. All of the questions were student-centered. How would you reach out to students? Um, have you ever had a challenge in the classroom? How did you resolve it? It's one of those like trippy questions. It's like, I don't want to tell people that I'm an incompetent teacher. I need to think of a good problem that I solved well. Um, and then the sample lecture topic. So usually the culminating point of your campus visit for uh, a comprehensive state university will be a sample lecture. And for me, that was my first clue, perhaps, that this was going to be different from anything I've ever done. Because the topic for my lecture was, like drum roll, Han China. Now, I'm a reasonably well-trained historian of the ancient Mediterranean. I had a lot of classes in Greek and Roman history. I did not ever have a class on China. So this is where I had to do a lot of research to prepare for uh, this sample lecture. Um, I mean, spoiler alert, obviously I got that job. So I did a halfway passable job, but essentially I learned just enough on the topic to be able to 
sound competent for 50 minutes. That was my sample lecture. Uh, and that was just kind of a preview of the learning curve involved. So remember that part where I said all things to all people? That is what you are doing. And Elizabeth will have more useful tips on the same kind of thing because really in that regard, um, the flexibility, uh, the learning curve uh, applies in liberal arts colleges as well. So how do you become all things to all people first and foremost in your teaching? Well, so better class uh, for, for me ended up being world history before 1500. And very quickly, well, really starting with my job lecture, I learned that a lot of stuff happened in the world before 1500. Um, and while some of it did happen in the ancient Mediterranean, a lot of really fascinating things happened outside of it. And now I get to teach a semester long class on this. Uh, and let me tell you, the first round was a little rough, but it's one of those things where, again, um, if you can master all of the things that you mastered to pass your PhD comps, you can definitely master teaching something like world history before 1500 or whatever other bread and butter class you are asked to teach in the future. You also get to recruit. So in uh, small or large um, regional comprehensives, there's always this sense of recruitment. You want to recruit students into your department, into your major. Um, and if you have a master's program, which by the way, a lot of uh, regional comprehensives would have, and in fact, my department has a master's in history, um, you get to work on recruitment. And that means teaching classes that are fun. So in our case, like whenever you can come up with a course title that's more than just Roman history or Greek history, um, something, I mean, it almost feels like selling out, but if we can put Indiana Jones in the course title, uh, it, it will fill or anything with war and violence. Um, so like we've joked about this as a department, war and violence will always fill. Uh, actually, sex does too. So um, combine all of those into a course title and you have a winner and it will recruit students into your program, which will be a fabulous thing for your department. After all, you're a team player, you're part of a program. But also you have to learn to reach non-traditional students. So for example, veterans or even active duty military. Uh, a few years ago, I had a student in an online survey class who was on active duty in Afghanistan. Uh, and it was, it was always a little bit scary if she missed an assignment. It was kind of like, are you okay? <laughs> um, so students who work night shifts and students who are caregivers, on quite a few semesters, I've had a student who gave birth at some point during the semester. So then you like to kind of, and they expect you to work with them, which is great um, because they want to stay in college. They don't want to leave college for a semester to have a baby, but um, it's the kinds of the kinds of students that perhaps you never remember encountering in your own undergrad program and your graduate school cohort, perhaps. Or maybe you did, depending on the institution. But in any case, that's your reality if you are at original comprehensive. And finally, speaking of online classes, virtually all growth in my institution over the past seven years has been 100% online students. I have so many students that have taken like four, five, six classes with me whom I have never met in person. They keep to take those classes. Uh, and complete their degrees, and they're doing great. So it's a different kind of mentality. Um, I'm really glad that early on in my time here, I, before the online push um, became really intense, I got trained to teach online. And I'm really glad I did that early on. So it's something, if you can do that now, um, I would encourage you to do that because a lot of universities are looking for that and that grows programs. What about service? Again, becoming all things to all people in your service. Tricky one. You need to be a good citizen, but you also need to know how to set boundaries. Uh, I made the mistake in my first couple of years of saying yes to everything. Um, and that was exhausting. I didn't need to do that, um, as I realized eventually. And I think I have a better balance now. Uh, but there's always a lot to do. And I would recommend in this age of constant cuts, do something that will make you indispensable. 
So for example, if you are a person running your department's website, that's huge brownie points. Or running academic assessment, you will be everybody's best friend. If you take over assessment, because nobody wants to do assessment, but it has to be done. Um, director of undergraduate or graduate studies. So um, I'm on my second round of doing director of graduate studies duty. And um, it's one of those things, again, that is really useful service. Um, you probably end up doing assessment for, uh, for that duty as well. And you are very much a good citizen if you take on these things. Creating new interdisciplinary programs. So remember that part where you may be the only classicist on your campus? Well, you can create a classics minor um, and work with other, other people who deal with something related. So there are a lot of potential for flexibility in kind of things like have you ever, ever dreamed of creating like an archaeology minor or something like this, something that doesn't exist on your campus, but where you can uh, bring together several faculty from different departments and make it happen. Again, like there's need for this and people will love you for it. Finally, your research. Yes, that's the last thing to mention. Uh, because it's the last priority. I mean, it's important, but it's not as important for your institution as teaching and service, which is kind of a shock to hear. Uh, but you can keep up a reasonably um, good research agenda. So block time for yourself to write a little bit every week, um, but set realistic goals. So for example, um, getting one academic article per year is reasonably realistic. Uh, maybe some book reviews, op-eds, so writing for the public. There's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of great resources out there on how to get started doing these things. And it's very, um, it's very rewarding. And remember also just be gentle on yourself. Some years are gonna be great and other years, maybe you're just in survival mode. That happens too. I mean, here we are in COVID year two. Um, but I will note that no one has ever been denied tenure in my institution in the past 10 plus years because of research. But we've had several tenure denials because of inadequate teaching or service. So basically, being a good citizen is a really, really good thing. So I'll stop there. I threw a lot of information at you, but hopefully it's helpful. And of course, there's time for Q&A. Elizabeth, do you want to go ahead and pick up there? Absolutely. I feel like I'm just going to be saying, it just do exactly what Nadia told you to do. That is that is the right answer. But I'm also going to share my screen with you. And uh, I think that in some ways, teaching at a liberal arts college is very similar. And, and the kinds of things that a liberal arts college is looking for are going to be things that are very similar in some ways to a regional comprehensive. So I teach at Kalamazoo College, which is in the state of Michigan. Um, in Michigan, we are obligated to hold up our hand like this, like the state of Michigan. And so Detroit's over here and I'm over here on the West Coast on the other side of the state. And I am somebody who also did not go to a liberal arts college. I went to the flagship state university in my state. And then obviously I went to a region, uh, an R1 for my PhD. And so it was not a place that I had really any experience or familiarity with, but it has turned out to be such a good fit for me. And I am really delighted that this has been where my career took me. Um, there are pros and cons of being at a liberal arts colleges. And the cons are maybe really obvious if you're coming from a, uh, an R1 as a graduate student, and which tend to be located in big cities and have lots of culture and other things going on. Um, liberal arts colleges are really teaching focused. And so there is more teaching required at them than there would be at a, um, you know, a, a state university, sort of a flagship university or a research university. Um, you have, again, 
just like what Nadia was saying, your program is going to tend to be small. You have few colleagues, if any, within your discipline. So you might be the only classicist. You might have up to four or five people in your department, but that is a pretty big department for liberal arts colleges. Most of them, I think, are about two or three people. Uh, there is much less emphasis on and support for your research. So we do have interlibrary loan and you can go to maybe one conference a year, but you're not going to have the kind of robust research career that you would have at a different kind of institution. And of course, liberal arts colleges tend to be small and they are often in sort of remote areas. And I don't, I happen to be in a pretty, you know, medium-sized city, but many, many places are sort of, it's, it's a hike to get to Indianapolis or something to get a flight out. And so if you're thinking about like your quality of life and where your family is, that is something to think about as you think about um, places like this. But for me, the pros way outweigh the cons. Um, as a teacher at a liberal arts college, I have so much autonomy. Um, you can imagine if you're in a program or of two or three people, if you decide to change the curriculum or change the way you're teaching Latin or change anything, you really just have to convince that other person that that's what you're going to do and you can change it. And so there is the freedom that you have at a place um, like a small liberal arts college is wonderful. Um, there is lots of interdisciplinarity just because you are a small place with few people, you have to partner with somebody and you're gonna partner with people all over the campus. Um, we have just over 100 faculty members on my campus. I know all of them by name. I know all of them by sight. I know what their research is. Um, and so when I need somebody to come into my class uh, to talk about bees when I'm teaching the Georgics, I know who to go for, right? Like I can call them up and we hang out all the time anyway. It's easy to make those kinds of interdisciplinary connections. Um, you have lots of opportunities to reinvent yourself because you're, what you do as a researcher is really not important to the college at all. Um, so if you decide as a Greek historian that you suddenly want to do nothing but Roman archeology, span they don't care, do whatever you want. And that also is a kind of freedom that you have at the liberal arts college. And there is a huge sense of community at places like this. And that also has been a real benefit for me. So what I think a lot of this, um, the ways that slacks are really different, I think is much of what you've heard already from Nadia. Teaching is by far the biggest part of what you do and it's the thing that counts most toward tenure. And it's the thing as a job candidate that they are looking for. They wanna see excellent teaching. Um, they will ask you lots of questions about your teaching, highlighting your teaching, as much as you can is a really, really good thing if you wanna get a second look. Service is a close second. Um, everyone on my committee, uh, everyone on my campus does a lot of service. My husband teaches at a regional comprehensive. He has maybe a committee that meets a couple times a semester. My committees meet weekly. Like we see ourselves as running the college and so our, our service components are really taxing. They, it's really considered important. Um, we also advise all students. So you may think about a job where you would only be advising classics majors or you would only be advising um, MA or PhD students, but all of our incoming students are assigned an advisor and many of my advisees, especially in those first years, are bio majors or econ majors. There's an expectation that you're going to understand the entire curriculum of your college and that you are uh, a sort of a member of that community, you're supporting the learning of all students. And so you really want to have a sense of um, how your part of it fits into this bigger holistic pic picture. Um, and there is this freedom to innovate. So as Nadia was saying, you can create a minor, you can create um, a major, you can decide with a group of other people who are doing ancient stuff in different parts of the campus that you really need an ancient studies major. Those kinds of things are easily possible at places where you just have fewer people and so fewer bureaucratic impediments. 
So if you are looking to write a job letter that is really going to catch the eye of somebody at a liberal arts college, what kinds of things do you want to do? Well, you obviously want to emphasize teaching and really the teaching of undergraduates, because for the most part, that's all any of us have. You definitely want to talk about being a the team player. You are a jack of all trades and a master. Well, and as much as you can be a master of all trades, you want to try to convince them of that. If you look at curricula at most liberal arts colleges, it tends to be pretty general. And there's at many places a sense that nobody owns the curriculum. So I, uh, my research for the most part is on Roman poetry but I teach Greek at all le levels. I taught Plato's Apology last year. I teach courses that have a lot of archeology span in them. I teach a lot of history, right? There is no sense in which like what I do is that I am the Latin poetry specialist. What I do is I teach classics broadly in all of its shapes and forms to all undergraduates. And so you should be thinking about ways to highlight your teaching of languages and history and material culture. And if there are other kinds of research areas or interests you have, like ecology or environmentalism or race or gender studies or any of those things, those are things to highlight as well. Especially because, for example, at my campus, our, we only have a halftime position for our WGS person. So we have a major and a minor, but people are contributing from all over the college. And so the more that somebody on that committee can see, hmm, you are somebody who could contribute to my thing, that makes you a more attractive person right off the bat. Uh, I think um, maybe things are changing slightly, at least when I was in graduate school, there was really no attention given to pedagogy or a sense that you have a pedagogical approach to the way you teach or why you teach the way you teach. But it, and I'm not suggesting that you go out and get one if you don't have one, but I do think that it's useful to contextualize how you teach and why you teach the way you do. That tells people at a teaching focused institution a lot. It certainly tells them that you care about teaching, which is the thing that we care most about. You should also know that the people who are reading these letters are not just classicists. They might not be historians. I will tell you that last night I was asked to serve on a computer science search committee this year, and I said yes. So. Pete, you might have a biologist reading your letter. You might have a, an American political scientist reading your letter. And your letter has to be intelligible to that individual. So you, it should not be filled with the kind of jargon that is going to alienate somebody. Those are people on the committee who have as much voice on that committee as I have. And if they look at your letter and say, I don't understand what this person is talking about, they're not gonna argue for you, no matter how much the classicist does. Um, and if there are other things that you do, you know, that last paragraph in your letter where you say, and I also played cello and I was an Olympic a shot putter or something like that. Like that is great information because it could be that the track and field uh, coach is looking for an assistant coach and your track, your shot put experience is going to be something, it's not going to seal the deal, but it again, humanizes you and makes you look more like a person that they want to see. So the tone of your letter really is one in as much as you can be authentic and seem like a human being, like that is going to take you so, so far. Because in a faculty of 100, we are really looking for other people that we want to work and play with. And, um, and if you're a faculty of two, you probably want someone who doesn't do exactly the thing that you do. But boy, you could do pretty much anything else. So we're looking for people who love teaching, who want to be a part of the community, who see themselves as whole people and not just big brains. So can you do, how can you do research if you're doing, you know, coaching the shot putters and teaching all of these classes uh, and everything else? Well, you do all the things that Nadia just told you to do because that's the exact advice I would give you. 
Um, one thing that's nice at, often at liberal arts colleges, certainly at my college, is you have a lot of control over setting your research agenda. So um, I know that uh, at other places they might say, you know, you need five articles or a book or something like that. Like it's very clear cut. For us, it's a real combination. So I could have a couple of articles on pedagogy and I could have a couple of articles that are sort of regular scholarship. And maybe I've done, uh, I contributed to a white paper for the city planning office or something. That's all research and that counts. And so I had a colleague recently in anthropology who wrote traditional scholarship, but she also had published poetry and short stories, creative writing, and all of that counted. She made the argument for why that is all her research. And that was totally fine with our institution. So um, research is really often what you say that it is. Um, and likewise, tenure denials really have only come for people who published absolutely nothing. Um, so publishing anything, articulating what you see as your agenda is the most important thing. And then that teaching, excellence in teaching and real um, hard work and service, those are the things that are going to matter equally, if not more. So I think that's everything for me. Okay, that's great. Thank you both so much. Um, we are gonna open up to Q&A. Um, you are welcome to type in questions in the chat. You're welcome to come off mic and ask them there. Uh, any and all things are acceptable. So uh, go ahead and um, uh, we'll, I'll wait to see if anyone wants to jump in immediately. Uh, and uh, the floor is open. Um, I, I have a quick uh, question about language instruction. Um, I was actually, uh, I, I had this question during uh, Nadia's uh, uh, presentation. So I, I was wondering at more uh, of these, of these like kind of small, uh, of these smaller schools, like what language instruction is like, and if, if kind of being able to teach, you know, multiple languages across different like uh, disciplines almost is, is something that is encouraged or if there's not actually really that much demand for all for for like Greek, Latin, and, and Hebrew because uh, like there's just not that many students and and I, I guess Elizabeth you sort of touched on that but yeah that was that was my question. Uh, so when I got to my campus, I asked like, does anybody teach Latin or Greek? And I was told Greek has never been offered and Latin was taken off the catalog just a few years before I was hired. Now, languages, all languages are taught in the foreign languages department. Now it's international languages and cultures. And they were kind of wary of having somebody else teach in their department. But I now teach an interdisciplinary uh, class, Latin and epigraphy for historians. And in fact, I'm teaching it this semester. It's packed. It is packed, man. Like all those students who are complaining about our foreign language requirement are jumping to get into that class. I think part of it is because it's 100% online. So all those working students are really excited about the 100% online class, but it's actually a history class. So they get history major credit for it. We're using Wheelock, but Wheelock also has this lovely Scribblers um, book, which is all like graffiti and inscriptions for students of Latin. So that's been the selling point. Like from week one, you're reading authentic, Roman texts, like Roman historical texts, and students are loving it. I've done this class before with Greek, so Greek and papyri. Um, I've thought about doing that with Hebrew sometime, and guess what? Nobody is going to tell me no. So that's the thing, like with, it's exactly what Elizabeth was saying. You want to teach something just because, like, if you want to teach it, you get to do it. So that's the freedom. Uh, the downside is, again, it's all on you to build your competency and all that. And sometimes classes like that are a little bit of extra work because it's such an experimental beast. Like, I don't know anybody who teaches this exact same class. 
although there are great resources, like the fact that Wheelock has this particular resource um, is fabulous. So uh, these are the kinds of things that I would talk about in an interview that, by the way, in addition to all kinds of traditional classes, I could teach this class. So especially if you were interviewing for a history department job or a religious studies job, I can see those kinds of things being um, suitable. And I would do your research, like make sure that there isn't anyone on that campus already doing those things, because then you can say, I can bring this exciting new thing that no one else on this campus is doing. Awesome, thank you. While uh, everyone else is writing down the uh, their questions or uh, thinking about perhaps what might might be something they want to ask, I had a question. Uh, I was somebody as somebody who was initially in classics to actually go teach at a community college uh, and kind of do that sort of move into a teaching specific career as opposed to a research specific career. Um, I was curious in my, my minimal experience of looking at what that might have been like while I was still in the graduate program. Um, community colleges typically aren't emailing, and I can say on both sides, they aren't emailing the SCS um, for their job postings. Uh, they sometimes aren't even up to date on their own websites. They'll be, you know, some will prefer to put it up on LinkedIn. Some will put it on their own job boards. Some have to hire out to third parties uh, because that's their university, you know, um, standard or guidelines to do. Um, so with a kind of decentralized process, what does that kind of the logistics of that job search um, perhaps look like, or what did it look like for either of you? Because that's what you can perhaps speak to the best. I mean, I guess I can say when, I mean, I think Nadia sort of said this, you know, when, we, when uh, I was on the market, I too just applied for anything and everything. Um, I'm also somebody who uh, I was writing my dissertation and I wasn't really sure this was the path I wanted to take. And so I took a break for a few years and I taught middle school. I taught English and Latin in a middle school and decided that I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life and so finished my um, my PhD. But, you know, I think that there are probably um, lots of places where you can sort of uh, look around and maybe that depends more upon um, if you've already found a place to live or a community, I mean, I think often uh, people move to a location because of a partner or because of family or other kinds of responsibilities. And you think, well, maybe my life as a teacher of Latin or Greek or ancient history or whatever is over because now I'm in place X and, and like, that's not going to happen. But we have a community college here in Kalamazoo, another one very close by in Grand Rapids, and another in Battle Creek. And we have people who routinely teach courses that are sort of like mythology or ancient history um, at places like that, who have really, I think, done um, sort of what you're talking about, Eric, like just sort of like finding an inroad, like a path in, and they see this wonderful person, and then they say, well, obviously, this person's class is enrolled, that's the most important thing, and if they say, well, and now I want to teach this, or I want to teach that, you get a lot of freedom to do that, and I know that at Grand Rapids Community College, they just recently started teaching Latin, really because they had like a phenomenal person there who took over a lot of these sort of classics oriented or adjacent courses. And now that's really becoming a program. So again, it's a lot of work on the individual, but that doesn't mean that if that's a path that seems possible for you or attractive to you, that it isn't, couldn't be a reality. It really, really could.
Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, Olga's question here in the chat. I'll read it out loud uh, just uh, for anyone who is perhaps listening and doesn't have time to look at the chat. Um, she uh, thanks uh, everyone so much for the information uh, and says, could you share a bit more about the selection and vetting process of candidates for liberal arts colleges, uh, especially what committees are looking for slash whether a PhD in hand is an absolute must or candidates who are for uh, finishing their dissertation also have a shot. She is also interested in hearing a bit about what the in-person stage of the selection process looks like, uh, such as campus visits or demos. Um, this is, um, it's a great question. And I think it really is probably going to depend on the school and the committee. I think um, a PhD imminent is definitely necessary. A PhD um, not yet completed is not necessarily going to get you out of the running if you have other things that make you look really, really attractive. So um, I ran a search uh, fairly recently, a couple of years ago, and we had, I don't know, 150 applicants or something like that. And But there were tons of people in the mix, right, in sort of those final stages um, who... Uh, had not yet completed a PhD. And it was really the letter that made them stand out. They looked like people who were interested in a lot of different things, who were interested in teaching, um, who had um, interests and expertise that were not mine. So those were, um, so those people definitely did. I mean, obviously for us, because teaching is such a priority and because there are so many job seekers, um, the more teaching experience you have, the you're just going to sound like a more authentic candidate, I think, because you can just say more, you've taught more. But that doesn't mean that other people are not out of the running. We've recently hired somebody in religion who was just coming brand spanking new out of a PhD program, just defended her dissertation. So we routinely hire people like that as well, if it's the right fit. Um, once people are on campus, we do have student people give a job talk, but we also do a teaching demo. We often have people demo a language class because it tells us a lot of information. Um, so, we have a language requirement. A lot of students fulfill it by taking Latin. And so we often have people teach Latin 101, Latin 102, something like that. Um, and we can, we also really value interactive teaching, active teaching. So, um, so those are things that good teaching really rises to the top in a, in a tough situation like that. But the other thing I would say is our candidates meet with people from all over campus. So you might have lunch with somebody in psychology and, and an art historian, and they are going to be asking you questions too and giving us feedback. And you'll meet with lots and lots of students, and they will give us lots and lots of feedback. We really care about what they have to say. So um, you're really trying to pitch yourself to, in this like kind of sweet spot where you show that you are super knowledgeable. You are also able to communicate this information in a way that is clear and comprehensible to a smart human being from 18 to 88 or something like that. Nadia, did you have anything to add to that uh, that answer? It really sounds so remarkably similar. It's one of those things where we keep thinking like small liberal arts colleges are totally different beasts from anything else. But and in some ways they are. I mean, like that small sense of community. But a lot of the same advice would apply for interviewing for a regional comprehensive. I will say. So my husband is um, a historian, American history. And he got a job uh, just straight out of grad school. And the key for him was that he adjuncted at local community colleges for several years before he defended. So when he came on campus, even though he was kind of like uh, the dark horse in that particular race, he actually stood out because he had experience teaching 
all of the surveys of American history. He even had experience teaching Western Civ, so things like that. And I think for classicists, so if you have uh, the opportunity to adjunct occasionally or teach as part of your PhD program, and man, that's rough. Um, like he has stories of some nights in grad school when he got five hours of sleep a night or less. But the point is some of these things, if you consciously kind of plan your, um, your teaching experience as a graduate student, that will really set you apart. In my case, my graduate program had very minimal teaching expectations. And um, when I was interviewing, I was very much at a disadvantage. I made up for it with visiting, um, with experience that I got as, uh, on visiting positions. But I realized when I went on the job market that having more teaching experience would have been really helpful initially. Great. Um, happy to keep moving on. And any more questions uh, that could come in? We have more than enough time for, for any questions you have. Well, if that is the case, uh, then I will uh, vamp the end of the of the session, and uh, if you have any questions, you can toss one in before I'm done. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thank you both Elizabeth and Nadia for presenting a, a somewhat unified and even though different uh, uh, presentation of of what this um, of what this situation might look like. We do have one more question coming in. It's a good thing I vamped. Um, I will wait for, you can go ahead and come off mic or you can type that in the chat, which is perfectly fine. Very good question. So what that reads is, uh, what are some of the biggest mistakes uh, that you've seen from potential candidates? Well, the worst, and that's kind of an epic story. Um, and I'm sure nobody would ever do this. Elizabeth is like, yeah, um, was when a candidate brought a catapult to his, um, to his job talk. This is this is a story before my time, but this is why we don't have a medievalist. He brought it and started shooting uh, projectiles into the audience, and it just didn't go well. So don't do that. Um, but uh, that's probably not helpful. Uh, the reality is, as long as you're prepared and professional, so just really prepare your talk. The standard like standard big mistake that we see. Um, so often on campus visits is candidates are not prepared for the teaching demo. Like one time we assigned a candidate um, a lecture and it was supposed to be a class that's an hour and 15 minutes. She gave a 50 minute lecture on that topic. And it was obvious that she just took a standard lecture on that topic that she would give in her regular classes and did not adjust to cover for anything. And there was just no engagement with the students. So things like that, um, we really look for effort. Like, did you actually prepare for your lecture demo? Uh, did you put some thoughts, uh, some thought into engaging the students? Uh, so my uh, lecture demo when I was um, when I was interviewing for this job uh, had to do with Han China, and I knew very little about Han China, even like preparing. Um, so one of the things that I did, I put up some pictures of points on the screen, and I asked students to come up and like point certain similarities. And students loved it. Like I made them get off, you know, get out of your seat, move around, point at things, conversation. And I got lots of brownie points for that. So that's like, think, and you don't have to do stuff like that, but basically just think, how can you connect to the students? You're teaching real life human beings uh, who want to engage with you. Uh, but that also allows you to show to uh, the search committee that you want to be there, that you really appreciate the students, you want to connect with them and so on. So think about those things. Wow, I would totally echo all of that minus the catapult. But uh, the, you know, in general, people give great job talks um, because you know your research so well, you are the expert in that thing. And the thing that you communicate about that to a sort of generalist audience is, um, 
you know, is going to be fantastic because you just know it backwards and forwards. So I will say sometimes we ask people to pitch their job talk so that a sort of an advanced undergraduate could understand it, right? Because we want to see what you can do. Like, can you convey information, not just to us, but to students. And so sometimes people pitch it too high, like you're pitching it to your fellow graduate students or to your professors, um, like it's an SCS talk. And that's not what your job talk should be at a liberal arts college in general. It should be, if they say it should be accessible, then you really do want it to be accessible, sophisticated, but accessible. But the biggest um, sort of falls I've seen have also been in the teaching demo, um, especially in language classes where they are not interactive at all. If somebody just stands at a board and says, let's go over these 10 Wheelock sentences, that is death, right? Like you, that is not going to work for us. Um, or people who just come in and start presenting material and make no effort to really engage the students. Again, that's not really going to, to work. The only other thing I would say is, I mean, you know, we say at these places, we want you to be all things to all people. And that's true. But you are one relatively young human being at the beginning of your career. And it is totally okay not to know things, not to have thought about things, not to have good answers for everything. Um, I think that people get in trouble when they sort of overpromise or when they start to exaggerate too much. So if somebody says, wow, um, have you ever taught Greek before? And you say no. And they say, wow, well, have you thought about teaching Greek? And you say, oh, yes, I've thought about teaching Greek every day of my life. I sleep it, I breathe it. And then, you know, somebody says, well, what, what would you do? What textbook would you use? And you have no answer. Then you start looking, that makes you look incompetent when you're not, right? So just be honest and say, no, I haven't thought that much about it, but I would welcome that opportunity. And I would love to plan something like that with you. And that is, tell me more about your approach, right? Like those kinds of things are better approaches to those questions. Great. Yeah, that took us right to the time where we needed to be. Um, so uh, thank you all again for uh, kicking off the first the first career development seminar of the year. Um, the next one will be uh, next month, uh, still deciding which Wednesday, but we're going an alternate Wednesday, Thursday schedule because people's teaching. Uh, if we just hold it on Thursday at the same time, then the people who always teach on Thursdays will email me. Uh, and we, we don't want that. But uh, the this talk will be uh, up on our uh, website as well as the YouTube page uh, whenever it's done processing um, so that if you forgot information or wanted to remember the information that was here, you have that available. And um, the rest of the information is going to be in SCS newsletters uh, and on the placement listserv. So thank you all again uh, and have a good rest of the Thursday. <laughs>